So, yes, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, I suppose. Um, I'm happy to talk today here. Um, it's a little bit different. I guess the year was for everybody of you different. Uh, different things have been achieved, different things haven't been achieved. Um, and uh, now I was a little bit excited to see some of you. Uh, I was messaging with uh, some of you guys uh, in the past days and uh, I say a virtual cheese, cheers uh, to everybody out there. And I hope we can um, be in contact live or in the web meeting at some point soon. Um, today I'm going to address um, a topic which is familiar to many of you guys, uh, introducing new metrology uh, to improve manufacturing um, um, processes. And we have gained quite some experience in this in the past years. And I just wanna share a little bit of this experience. I have a lot of slides, it's about 70 slides. Uh, so I will just go very briefly through many of them since you have the ability to stop and have a look at those slides and continue. If you are interested in some of those uh, in more detail, you can do that. So I think by this, uh, I can address more features and you can jump to sections that you are interested in. Um, so at least uh, the logo looks a little bit different here. Um, anyway, I will continue. So I talked today about uh, system selection and dimensioning strategies. My name is Markus Klein. I'm Managing Director of Suragos. I have been at AIMCOL, I think, the past five years. Um, we are here located in Germany, in Dresden, and I will speak about it in the beginning before addressing the motivation, uh, and then I will go into the process for selecting metrology. Um, and if, finally, I will summarize it. So Ragos is in the heart of Europe, I would say, uh, Dresden. We are right at the airport. Uh, typically, I can see outside the airplane starting and landing. Uh, in the last six months, not so many, but we are still connected uh, to Frankfurt and Munich and many other cities. Uh, we are a German privately owned company and uh, we do quality assurance systems for SYNFILMS based on eddy current inspection technology. And I will talk about this uh, more in detail today. My personal history is that I'm working now for more than 10 years in, in this field. Uh, and I have been explaining the process of uh, searching for the right inline metrology tool and going through the project process of um, selecting it, parameterizing it uh, many, many times. And I just want to share best practice approach how to do that and uh, contribute by that uh, to the society of INCOR. So many questions need to be asked and answer it when getting a new inline metrology tool. Um, so what's the best technology? What is the best vendor? What's the best sensor setup? What is the best parameterization? What are the most suitable interfaces? How does the software need to look like and what needs to be visualized? What needs to be stored so these are many questions and i offer um, a kind of a 12 step approach so first of all is the approach is a, re a definition of the measurement task so here it is required um, to think about what do i need to know is it a physical parameter like thickness color sheet resistance or barrier property or is it the relative uh, property which i just need to know the homogeneity going up or down um, or do I need a specific other function to ensure my, my uh, code the function of the coding? Do I need to have one measurement per roll or do I need a measurement every meter or every millimeter? That's important. And uh, do I need to measure in many positions on the web or just in the center of the web, cross web or center of the web? So these are questions that need to be uh, um, defined in the beginning. And of course, I need also to think about who should see this information. Is this just a process engineer when he sets, sets up and changes the target, for instance? Uh, or is it also dedicated to send a protocol to the customer? So there are different possible answers to that. And this imply, this affects also the type of methodology needed. 
So there are many um, requirements and in the second step, uh, I need to select a technology and before that I need to define the requirements. So what is my measurement range? That's an important question. What is the required accuracy that can affect the costs? Uh, what is my level of automation ability? Uh, what is the level of uh, reliability? Um, do I need to imply in vacuum or not? And uh, what are the costs uh, or what is the budget available? So these things I need to think first. Uh, I need to think it through first before getting out to potential uh, customer uh, suppliers. How can I find the right technology? So the first step is uh, to find the technology. And typically a good source is of course, literature and the internet, uh, maybe your network, you know, people from InCall and maybe other friends and colleagues that have been done gone through this process. Um, then there is um, the idea of uh, direct and clustering the methods into direct and indirect methods. So direct methods measuring these parameter uh, in an absolute way and indirect methods measure something which correlates to that parameter that I would like to measure. And often this can, uh, can be an effective way to address this in a more easy way. Um, there are destructive, non-destructive methods. Destructive methods are usually only used for validation. Um, and it's also good to understand the, what distinguishes the substrate from the coding because somehow you need to focus on what you want to characterize and not on what you don't want to characterize. It's good to find a physical uh, way of uh, separating it. So it can be conductive and non-conductive materials or transparent non-conductive materials or reflective or non-reflective materials or ferromagnetic or non-ferromagnetic materials. Then there is um, um, the the, after the research, you have a lot of methods on the hand and uh, I put a summary in this to this talk on metal thickness methods because I think it's uh, relevant for many people. Thickness is rather general. Um, and there is in my presentation here an overview on thickness gouges, on mechanical thickness gouges. To be fully fair, this is uh, from 1997. So it's a rather old source. So all the numbers in there might be not up to date. Uh, anyway, it's a good overview by this uh, Mr. Nietzsche uh, on its good introduction and um, it has a lot of value. My idea is uh, maybe for the 50th anniversary, I will rewrite this book um, to make a, make a good update because there are not so many uh, literature out there which summarizes that in a good way. Um, there are um, sickness methods by weight determination, you know, quad monitoring method, most of you guys know. But there are also other weight methods I've seen in the field. Um, there are radiometrical methods, um, which are quite mature, have a rather high cost uh, and need to consider um, safety measures, but they are um, applicable to many applications. Um, there are magnetic sickness gouging methods, which require uh, magnetic layers, of course. There are optical sickness gouging methods, which somehow require some sort of transparency. Um, there are ultrasonic methods, which are typically used for thick layer characterization. There are electrical gouging methods, uh, which are used uh, yeah, for contact testing of layers uh, mostly. Um, Four-point probe methods are pretty popular. And uh, then there are also eddy current uh, gouging method, um, yeah, which requires conductive layers um, and has a very large measurement range. And it's, it's really, really fast method. So after you have been through all these different possible technologies, so typically you can narrow it down to some of those. In this uh, example here, I limited to 100 nanometer layer thickness measurement, which is faster than 10 seconds uh, <clears throat> per measurement. Um, and then I have a field of, uh, let's say this is uh, seven methods. And um, typically you need to narrow it down further. So if I narrow it down further, I can get up to um, 10 nanometer to 1000 um, nanometer. And let's say I want to do more than one second, more than one measurement per second. 
And then in my example, uh, you end up with four point probe method and eddy current method. Yeah. And of course, this is a field of my work. Um, and I want to share a little bit what we do with it. Um, we characterize uh, in the left in the left column conductive coatings on non-conductive substrate. This is the most easy part. So applications involve packaging faults, battery collectors, transparent conductive electrodes, solar control, and and low E layers, metallization on wafer mirror coatings. Some applications in fuel cells and separate uh, supercapacitors are also there. And then there is column B, which is a little bit more complicated to characterize conductive coatings on conductive substrates. So this is, uh, for instance, lithium on copper, uh, panel level packaging, which is a application from semiconductor industry, where metals are characterized on metals. Um, PV, there's ITO on uh, wafer, for instance. And there is C is the most challenging part, which we are now also able to cope with is low conductive coatings on high conductive substrates, which is required for battery electrodes. And I would be more than happy to talk to people involved in that um, later on. But today let's focus on A. So we have 10 nanometer to 1000 nanometer um, coatings on non-conductive substrates. Um, and we want to measure more than one measurement per second, let's say 10 measurements. And then there are two methods available. And this are uh, the eddy current method and the sheet, re uh, and the four, uh, four point probe method. And both measure basically the sheet resistance, which can be co uh, which correlates to, to layer thickness once you know the, um, the specific, uh, connectivity or the resistivity. So basically here applies half the layers, uh, thickness is double the sheet resistance. So there is a correlation. There are many ways to, for different materials to set this up. Um, important to understand is, um, the difference between four point probe and eddy current is that eddy current measures basically the top coding. If there's an isolation uh, below, it doesn't see this. Any material which is below eddy current measures all conductive layers. Yeah. Um, it's measuring, um, it's measured in ohm per square. That's a unit that's basically, uh, it can be converted to thickness, um, can be measured um, directly. A non-conductive substrate can be measured also through encapsulation. If there are more than one conductive layer, then can be separated by pre and post measurements. Um, so there's a formula one divided by R total equals one divided by R1 plus one divided R2, and then you can continue. And by that, you can separate many layer stacks. Often, you know, pre-coding status, uh, sometimes you need to measure, it depends on the application. Um, if you want to calculate things, uh, you are invited to visit our calculator. We set a um, calculator, which allows you to do many calculations around uh, thickness, uh, connectivity, resistivity, single layer systems, multi-layer systems on our website. And it makes it very easy to, to think those layer stacks through. Um, next, once you have selected or uh, narrowed it down to two, maybe three uh, um, technologies that might work for you, you need to understand those in detail. I already addressed that uh, there are differences in what they can see. I think the main key is uh, that um, eddy current is non-contact and can measure very fast. So our fastest application measures uh, six meter fast moving substrate uh, and we measure every 0.2 millimeter, um, which is uh, really, really fast. And there are also yeah, imaging solutions and so on. So it has, has quite, quite some benefit. Um, also in terms of repeatability, um, you have a higher repeatability because you not depend on the way you contact um, um, the material. Um, so people who have worked with software probes, they know it that, that it, even though it offsets the contact uh, resistance, uh, but there are some difference uh, depending on how well you uh, align the probe. Um, yeah, so that's a um, big advantage of eddy current. Um, 
yeah, Eddy Current um, basically uses, uh, induces um, electromagnetic um, fields or induces currents by creating electromagnetic fields. Um, we apply an alternating current onto a coil which generates electromagnetic field. When your material is passing through this field, we generate eddy currents in those fields and those in those um, layers. And so those send us a, a secondary field which is characterized by our sensor. And this allows us to make uh, pretty fast uh, measurements which are well automatable. Um, there are different, um, yeah, setups, um, coil and receiver setups. There are different ways to measure electromagnetic fields. There are different types of eddy current, uh, uh, single frequency, multi-frequency, spectral, impulse eddy current. There are reflective approaches, there are transmittive approaches. So these are, there are many, many setups uh, depending on what, what is going to be measured. Um, there are also um, setups that combine testing solutions. Uh, so we have also a solution where we uh, measure optical and electrical through um, an eddy current coil, um, the reflectance, the transmittance, and even the haze. So it's a pretty nice solution for people who characterize the um, all, all properties of a transparent conductive material or make key relevant properties. Um, but apart from this, any current is used to characterize thicknesses from two nanometer to two millimeter and sheet resistances from 0.1 milliohm per square to 10,000 ohm per square. We have even a solution which can do like 250,000 ohm per square. There are imaging solutions. It's also used for def to find defects. And I mentioned the, com the hybrid solution. Okay, this one looks weird in, in this black, uh, um, at least in my screen, it looks black. Uh, basically, it's just information that sheet resistance correlates with emissivity. Um, this, uh, on our website, if you go to measurements and emissivity, you can see the explanation and also how this formula, where this formula comes from. And the same is uh, it's addressed uh, with sickness, sickness and sheet resistance correlate. Uh, we have uh, also um, applications where we characterize uh, calendrate and non-calendrate electrode coatings on conductive substrates. And even um, there are applications where we use the uh, permeability of coatings, uh, also the permeativity of wet coatings to characterize uh, coatings and also the conductivity. And these give us different information some applications so we measure, we use the permittivity to measure moisture. I'm just sharing a few new items um, for, for, the, for the network here. Um, so it's a pretty, um, pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty flexible technology. High frequency eddy current is sensitive to permeability, to permittivity and conductivity, and this can characterize uh, quite unique uh, characteristics. Even on one coding, you can separate some of these uh, from each other. Repeatability is important. I showed a little bit before. Um, so there are repeatability in low ohm, medium ohm, high ohm, and also long-term stability is a fact that matters. We have those charts for different ranges. Uh, so if somebody is interested in a specific application, ask your vendor about those repeatability and long-term stability data. It's valuable to see whether the solution uh, will be okay or not. Um, there are, then the next step is selecting the hardware. There are different head dimensions typically and different geometries available with different vendors. Sometimes there are different um, sensors uh, available. We have isotropic and unisotropic sensors uh, to measure also the, the resistance in different directions. It can be also imaged for, it's basically used for nanowires and carbon nanotube materials. Then there are mounting and frame concepts which need to be considered uh, A, B, C, D, E, and there are different, different reasons to use uh, different frame concepts. There are traveling sensors, there are fixed sensor setups. Um, the question is, uh, what, do you, what are you able to change in your process if you are can only turn it on or off, and typically one sensor is good enough. 
uh, when you can change the center the center to edge uniformity because you have maybe different uh, sources of material, then you might benefit from more sensors. Um, if you have line defects, um, slot die coding, you can have line defects. You might benefit from a traversing system, which can find this line defect immediately and tell the machine uh, to stop or to do some, uh, at least call a process engineer. There are different frame layouts, ex vacuo, in vacuo, um, conveyor integrated, not conveyor integrated. Um, so this uh, is a little bit um, different. Typically, we like not to touch uh, the um, the conveyor for different reasons. Uh, it's good to have it isolated for different reasons. Then there are requirements uh, from the process view. Um, basically, from the process view, people typically people want to have uh, the system close to the process to have prompt feedback. And from the methodology system, there are also things that make the methodology make it for the methodology system more easy. Typically, most of methodology, uh, especially optical methodology, likes when the web is not fluttering too much on the substrate. Eddy current is quite tolerant to that. Um, then this can be achieved by installing the sensor close to the roller, uh, in between two rollers. Uh, the different setups are shown on the left here. Um, yeah, there are yeah, fluttering, high ten, fluttering might be an issue. Tension variation might be an issue when you cut the web. There might be sagging a little bit. Uh, add splices when you attach to uh, to uh, webs. The splicing to go through, you need to have a large a large gap. Don't have the too less uh, distance to the substrate. It's always good to have at least uh, ten or twenty millimeter distance to the substrate for many reasons. And there might sometimes also temperature is and it, it needs to be considered. We are having a new sensor uh, now which can cope up to 200 degrees Celsius. Um, and we are working on a 600 degree uh, sensor. Um, so vendors might have different requirements and also the process might have different requirements, but this needs to be considered for this, for this uh, position. Then there's a question how much data is needed. Um, I can take technically 25,000 measurements uh, per sensor per position. It's a lot of data, typically not so much data as needed. What is really needed is the question here. Uh, what needs also to be stored? Can I summarize it? Maybe just keep the minimum, maximum and the average and maybe the position of some, some outliers. Uh, so summarizing data is, is a big point. Um, also, who needs to have the data? Is it a process engineer or is it uh, the product, the customer of this product? Um, and then there's also what kind of signals need to be connected? We recommend uh, that the measurement system is sending the measurement values to the process uh, system um, and also the system status. Uh, the system is okay if there are some thresholds. Uh, um, then we send an alarm extra so the coding engineer is, uh, is aware of something is happening. But at the same time, it's good to have a connection from the process machine to uh, the methodology to, for instance, give an equidistant trigger. So you have, you know where you have measured or reset this trigger, run a self-reference. Most of the methodology have an ability to zero it. Uh, so this can be triggered by the machine. So there are some, some things that need to be considered. And of course, the type of interface, there are many options. And finally, there is um, um, the decision, what is the best reference uh, for, for um, these um, systems? Many systems work indirect, so they have some kind of internal absorption, um, optical absorption, electrical and ma magnetic absorption, or radiometric absorption. And this needs to be correlated to the value of interest. And this is done by standards. Typically, it's good to have high level standards like we have these standards, which we bring on site and the customer can then measure these standards with the existing, uh, in our case, four point probe. And he sees whether there's an offset between these and his four point probe. Um, and then he can decide whether he wants to have his, his values uh, calibrated or the least values, and at least it's good to be aware of uh, of the 
um, of the differences, but if there are differences. In some cases, there are differences, many, very often there are no difference at all. Then there is also sometimes need to calibrate in different environments. There are some tricks uh, that can be done. Um, and finally, after everything is understood, which technology, what is the window, what are the interfaces and positions and so on, there's then the final part of integration, uh, the mounting, installation, wiring, following the block diagram, setting up the software interfaces, system test, in place recalibration, and then final check. Then the ramp up of the tool, if it's a new facility, um, starts. And um, finally, uh, the installation has been done, but our job now is uh, to support things. Uh, some people need training, uh, some people have questions. So this is then uh, the second life of uh, the corporation, second part of the corporation to do all the service, uh, especially with complex uh, technology, good service is, uh, is important. I just want to show you some examples. Finally, um, inline wafer inspection, you have conductive material on conductive coatings, or OPV uh, on the roll coating. Printed electronics is pretty popular, becoming more popular, I would say. Um, then anisotropy of nanowires, this is, uh, um, um, this has some, quite some potential for touch panel sensors. Um, he has conductive polymers um, here, PWPSS, you can see it because of the blue, um, blue color of the web. Yeah, um, yeah, we have also like multi sensor we call it a sensor line solutions where we have a certain number of sensors uh, uh, integrated into one housing and we can make a very dense measurements. Uh, we call it eddy current camera. Then there are like uh, high-speed codings on mirrors, uh, some one application and other applications, classical low E on glass or TCO on glass is also an application. I just wanted to go through different applications that, that we do um, and that uh, we've been run with our customers through this process I just explained. So the take home messages are, there are many questions uh, that need to be raised along the installation of a new metrology tool. It looks a little bit complicated, but in the end it's a, it's a standard process um, and it's moderated, uh, can be moderated by the vendor. Um, good vendors have such process available and they guide you, they walk you through this, uh, through this process and ask the right question. Um, and even though if sometimes another tool or another technology is more suitable, um, there can be also an outcome. Um, and um, it's also true that uh, getting the best solution requires some work from the tool owner and, and from the methodology vendor, but the effort is worth it because those tools run for decades and um, yeah, a good uh, setup can, can be beneficial for a long time. Yes, so this was my uh, my presentation today. Um, I yeah, I'm really a little bit sad that I cannot be there. I have uh, met uh, many people of you, and uh, I can really say I, I miss uh, these uh, nice events and uh, good, nice conversations. Uh, and I hope that we can make this up all next year. <laughs>